Hey, welcome in everybody to the third installment of the JB and Steel Shows. We're here to break down the latest and the greatest sport news for you in the NHL, NFL, and the minors going on as well in hockey. Plus a little bit on the lockout, but we'll save that more for future weeks since it doesn't seem like there's an end in sight yet for that when it comes to the MLB. But yeah, shame about that. Yeah, we all enjoy everybody that subscribed as far over at Steel Flyers and at Sports Fanatic News. Please continue to subscribe to show us your love and support. We appreciate you all and love you all for it. But Steel, how are you doing tonight? Oh man, I'll tell you what. I am ready for another edition, volume three of the JB and Steel Show. Really, really enjoy sitting down here talking with Professor Joe about all the great stuff that's going on. A lot of great sports action, a lot of great things going on on the ice and off the ice, a lot of great things going on the field, a lot of great things going off the field as well, too. So I'm very excited about this. Thank you all very much for checking us out. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate it. Uh, Really appreciate all the work that you're doing, Joe. Um, Keep banging away, man. All the great coverage for all of the minor leagues, the the AHL with the Phantoms, and then also with the Reading Royals, man. Keep up the great stuff. If you guys aren't following pro Joe, then you should be. All right, my man, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. The first right. thing we were going to touch on is unfortunate news in the NFL for one of Steele's team's uh, rivals, which is the Baltimore Ravens. After falling by one, find out that one of the top cornerbacks or secondary yeah. people, really in general, in Marlon Humphrey, is expected to now be out for the season yeah. as they now in the standings are not. They fell back if we look at the overall standings. They're the Baltimore and Ravens to eight and four. That's what it is now. Yeah. So they're eight and four to the Bengals being right behind them at seven and five. Yeah. And the Steelers at six and five if they could six, five and one if they can go on a run. So the with Marlon Humphrey, it'll be interesting to see how that affects them going forward. But it seems like with this division, unless if the Bengals can keep with them. I feel like That's gonna the be Steelers are, yeah. yeah, the Steelers are kind of like my Eagles, where they've been showing some signs, but they're not really probably fully there to be a playoff team. So, like, <laughs> compete and stay close and make you be yeah. have some false hope type thing. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. And it's false not hope, really yeah. good at probably get you to the players. Okay, okay, be like, okay, oh, okay. we were only a couple out though, so like yeah, it would be like one of those things. Uh, I tell you what. Um, I have really been impressed with what Joe Burrow and Cincinnati has been able to do. Um, I was very high on Joe coming out of college. I watched him play in college. So I was like, man, this this guy's going to be the real deal. And he's proven to be just that, the real deal up there in Cincinnati. And he's got this team on the verge. I mean, let's face it, seven and five. When have you ever heard anybody talking about the Cincinnati Bengals being of any relevance? Lately? No, yeah. Yeah, he has to obviously he went up against one of the other great uh young quarterbacks in the game and Herbert and they outdueled him. Uh he got killed this week, forty one to twenty two, dislocated his pinky finger in the process. Uh, right. Um the reports are that Joe Burrow uh, plans to play through that. Um, so we'll see how that happens and see how that goes going forward. But yeah, he's been one of the more exciting guys to watch. Obviously, in that division, it seems like it's going to come down to uh, the Always Cincinnati does. Bengals going to take advantage of their schedule going forward with not as key of a defensive injury to them. And is the Moreland Humphrey injury going to affect the uh, Ravens defense, not only from a just player standpoint but from the fact that he's one of the leaders on the defense standpoint too being Agreed. for the Agreed. Ravens as well so we'll have yeah. to see how that goes moving well forward. that injury actually affected the call on the field was to why the Baltimore Ravens went for two uh during their during their um attempted comeback at the end of the game um instead of kicking the field goal uh, because they didn't feel that they would be able to put up a good enough defense against the Pittsburgh Steelers with their receiving core with Humphreys being out. So that's why they went for two on that play uh, and, you know, obviously was unsuccessful. And so, but um, that's that like was, a strategizing part of the game that people don't always see from the outside looking in because you don't realize if you just tuned into the game that more than Humphrey might have got down to like you said, cause that after effect, which is going for two. 
Right, exactly, which is what uh, which is what Harbaugh did say in his press conference, that that was why he did go for two was because of Humphreys being injured and unavailable to go because if they would have gone for the tie, then that means that Pittsburgh would have gotten a chance to get the ball and he would have had to be out there on the field. You know yeah. what I mean? And and so with him not being there that and, and them not being as prepared to handle that big giant hole back there in their defense. You know what I mean? Now they have the week off or, you know, this, this coming week and whatever, whatever. So now they can better plan for that, but that makes it a lot harder. So that, so he definitely said that that played in his decision as to why they went for two instead of for kicking the field goal and going for the tie on that game. So, uh, but that makes sense. Yeah. But going back to what you said, Joe, Kansas City still oh still uh, up there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So until you knock off the big dog, then it doesn't really yeah, matter. Well, it's also Kansas City's winning in a different capacity this year. In the yes. past, it's all been offense, mainly offense, offense. Where this year they haven't had is crispy clean of an offense throughout the season. Tapes but they out found on it from their defense. And they've been able to find momentum plays from the defense. Like, what is it, Sorensen, I think, was the guy that got the pick yesterday. And he's not even yeah. the guy that's always on the defense. Yeah. <laughs> guy. And he gets a big play that gets your team going. So, like, everybody, it kind of has that everybody step up mentality on the defense. Exactly. That is a huge thing going forward. And this is a team yeah. that, if their offense gets going like it has in the past, they're going to be ridiculously dangerous with the way that defense is going and then on the stay on the positive front for the or not for the Giants for the Lions fans at least for Vikings fans it seems like a repeat of every year you have one of those losses that you're like how in God's grace did we lose to this football franchise uh but they lost to the Detroit Lions as golf throws a game ending touchdown literally a buzzard beater I mean the game and uh that's the Vi- one of the Vikings' losses and the only win for Detroit. As far as in Detroit, they can rejoice and be glad for a win. And in Minnesota, it seems like maybe wow. this will be the time that eventually this season Zimmer, it, it runs out and having just that average mediocrity each year yeah. is eventually going to get stale. We'll have to see, though. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm with you. And then with Minnesota having a – turn right around here and play a quick game again then on Thursday night here against the Steelers coming off the the the, the win against the Ravens so that that, that there that, that's that's going to be that's going to be a tough game I think for really both teams against the Steelers I feel like that might be it they're not going so? you're good I don't think you're going to get rid of a coach obviously yeah. in a short week like I feel yeah, like, like that's this. not going to be the case where after but, Thursday, if like the Steelers come in, especially a Steelers team that's been very roller coaster this year, yep, yep. comes in and basically just flattens you, yeah. then I feel like you're and it's in Minnesota too, so that's right. going to pull more weight. Right, I feel like you're that's going to be kind of the final stroll there, similarly to how something we talked about later. We're going to talk about later a certain coach here in Philadelphia having a final stroll and a big defeat. So it seems like that might be the same thing there if they go that way on. On Thursday, because it seems like each year there's that one loss or two losses in the season for the Vikings that they have no business losing to those teams. And that's what keeps them in the average mediocrity phase rather than actually getting to be a better contending team like their roster kind of projects in most seasons than they're actually putting out. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that 100 percent. And I do also agree, too, that it's going to go a long way to telling what the Steelers are going to be as well, too, with this Thursday night matchup, too, because Minnesota's not exactly a bottom feeder team per se. You know <laughs> what I mean? They're, but anyway. they're just an incredibly inconsistent team. Exactly. So which which uh, Minnesota Vikings team is going to show up against which Pittsburgh team? <laughs> yeah, right? you can pretty exactly. much just roll the bones on both of those guys, and all right, whatever team's going to show up, that's the game you're going to get. You're either going to get a shootout, right, because no defense can stop anything, or it's going to be a slugfest. Yeah, take your pick, whichever way you want it. No, yeah. that's entirely true. Um, I, I agree with that. It's going to be interesting to see, but. Thursday's ways way ahead now, as we usually do a preview since 
we'll do our projections, not really a preview since the game will be on after we release this show. But we have a Monday Night Football as we're recording this show coming mm-hmm. and starting soon. Oh, man. The Pats versus the Bills, which is obviously the Bills in the beginning of the season. Looked like they were in the division running. They were the team to beat in that division. And then all of a sudden, it tilted back in the other direction. The Patriots started winning. The Bills were sputtering a little bit. And now the Patriots are up 8-4 to four to the Bills being a 7-4 and four record. So this is the game that either evens it up or yep. the game that kind of puts the Patriots in a much better seating to be kind of able to move forward and feel better about themselves. Because then if the Bills lose another game and they win, they're three games ahead and really feeling good about themselves coming into the stretch run here going forward. So this is a game that's huge. For, I would say the Bills the most because they're trying to be the team that wants to overtake still that other than last season, that Patriots team that and be the new dogs that kind of keep winning in the division and take that crown where the Patriots are trying to reclaim saying we're not ready to give up that crown yet. We have Mac Jones in here. We should have a great defense and we're just going to win doing similarly to what they did early on with Brady just dump and duck run the ball, run a very simplistic but effective offense, and have a very good defense. See, and and true, um, I also felt, too, that the Bills were going to beat. Now, they dropped that first game against Pittsburgh. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, since then, I mean, seven and four. Now, New England is eight and four. Okay? So... Both teams have ha- have a winning record on the road. Both teams have, well, <clears throat> the the New England Patriots have a losing record at home. Yeah. Okay. The Bills do have a really bad loss, though, that 9-6 to six loss to right. Irvine's, uh Jacksonville Jaguars. Jaguar. That, yeah, that was, that was kind of that. Yeah, that was not yeah. a good look when you're trying to compete with a team like the Patriots for the top of the division. I'm with you. But I'll tell you what, though, over the years, even with the last few years with Brady there, especially with when they drafted Josh Allen, uh, I really like him. I really like his game. I really think he's a good quarterback up there for Buffalo. I think he's a good quarterback. He hasn't been the same quarterback in the last four to change weeks, which is why the Bills – Having sometimes Josh Allen's got them out of trouble in games where lately yes. he hasn't done that. Like for example, that Jags game, you didn't see the magical in the magic in the hat you've seen in past games where if everything's going wrong, he just kind of figures it out type deal. Exactly, exactly. You know what I mean? And so I'm just sitting here looking at like the rankings to see where they are, right? New England is eighth. And Buffalo is 10th Uh in the league rankings, right? So this is going to be one of the few Monday night games that, you know, you might want to tune into. This is the one I think this is probably one of the, if not the premier, one of the premier ones, because it's for, like I said, is Buffalo going to tie the division or is Buffalo going to fall back and falter more in the division hopes and then have to go more for the wild card? At that point, if the Patriots keep winning and don't really suffer many losses for the rest of the season on their end. So this exactly. is really probably one of the biggest, if not the premier game in the NFL for Monday night football. Agreed. Probably, uh, yeah, but yeah, but- I agree. I agree. And and there's a lot of playoff implications because this is interdivisional. OK, uh, if 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 uh, a Bills win, they tie with New England. In record wise, they'll both be eight. Well, no, it'll be, uh, it'll be, um, uh, New England will be eight and five. Well, yeah, they'll be tied eight and five. So no, five, eight and five and eight and eight, no, eight and five to eight and four. So that would actually flip the bills for the time being, right? To the first place spot, but that's just because of the games totals there, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that that could and that puts them at first place back you know what i mean and so i really do think this is a marquee matchup tonight yeah so I, I had that wrong the bills would flip up because it's a, it would be yeah it would be eight and five to uh eight and four at that point because of game totals yeah good point yeah right so but but also the fact too that mac jones has been playing bloody outstanding 
I mean, I would say he uh, he'd have to be rookie of the year right now as far as quarterbacks going. Uh, and they had six the quarter six rookie quarterbacks start this year, I think. Yeah, he could potentially be. I haven't really looked at the numbers like that heavy in terms of um, the rookie of the year numbers, but he definitely would be up there. Uh, it would depend how much people look at what's put on that rookie. Where, like, they, I'm not saying they don't put. They obviously put a lot on Max shoulders, but they also run like I got done saying. Belichick runs a very structured offense that when he has a new guy in there, he really nurtures them well into it. You saw it with Brady in his early careers, and then they opened it up like three years into his career. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They'll probably end up doing a similar structure with Jones, well, but Jones obviously was a guy that was an earlier round talent that spread it down the field. So you see that mixed in a little bit more in the first season, but I think he's a great, a very good quarterback. He's typically, he's basically what he was. We said he's going to be a good passer, a good guy that controls the pocket, What's his overall ceiling where all these other guys were, they have all this great athletic talent, they can move, but are they going to be able to become as good of an accurate guy as yeah. the guy like Matt Jones, who was kind of just a throwback quarterback. Like he exactly. was the throwback and throw it, just drop back, throw it. Everybody else was the new wave, can do it all and do different things okay. on the field type guy or type. So, right. but also another thing we should point out is just because it uh, helps us out, of, of course, and still, you brought it up that we didn't do it at the beginning. Is if you enter this man's great um, sports name, Steel Flyers on Manscape, you get twenty percent off and free shipping. So definitely do that as well. For sure, man. Check that out. Go to manscaped.com. Um, type in the promo code Steel Flyers. Get twenty percent off your entire order plus free shipping. So go check that out. Just in time for Christmas. Look good in the boardroom and the bedroom. Get things taken care of upstairs and downstairs. It'll be good for you. Take care of it right there. But what I want to point out here real quick, too, is that Mac Jones, 16 of 8, 16 touchdowns, 8 uh, interceptions. Josh Allen, 25 of 10, right? Mm -hmm. They're both uh, Josh Allen, 66%. Pass completions, uh, Mac Jones, 70%. They both have 7.5 yards per attempt, right? Um, Allen is at 3,000 yards, and Jones is 28.5. So as far as quarterbacks go, man, they're pretty much, you know what I mean? I, I Joe Bur or, uh, Josh Allen has a couple more attempts, uh, 410 compared to Jones, 381. Right. Um, so any, but that's well, the I system that you're talking about yeah, with I Mac Jones compare. being up there with Belichick. Um, so, but it's just like you said, um, Jones is the better quarterback when it just comes to being a straight raw quarterback. Okay. Some of these other guys have, you know, mobility and everything else like that and all that's all fine and great, but you know, well, Mac Jones is also in a perfect situation, I think, for like going to the Patriots, like a lot of people are saying coming to the draft would just be the perfect fit where yeah. other guys are in a situation. They have to get out of broken plays where Mac Jones, they haven't had to do that that much, where he's not a quarterback that would do that. Like Mac Jones, for example, if he was here in Philadelphia or the quarterback for the Detroit Lions, he would not be having the same exact statistical numbers as he's having with the Patriots because it would just be very difficult to do so because of you're getting beat around and you would have to escape or slide level. the pocket and all yeah. that. And mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not. So I think that plays in, but I think out of quarterbacks, he's the most that stand it out because other guys haven't as much or have been banged up. But when it comes to now the next thing, before we move on to hockey, the quick thing I want to say is, just because this is going to be something we're talking about more in the future, since unless if a miracle happens, it won't be resolved by next Monday, is the MLB lockout. Of course, the owners locked out the players, and it was for multiple reasons uh, combined with um, the them wanting the rise, the threshold, the DH, the fact that they want an international draft, uh, yada, 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 where in the next week's episode, we'll go into a deeper depth of the exact reasons why that's the case, where this week we're going to focus on firings around the NHL and different league news in the NHL, because there are, from both sides' perspectives, reasons that kind of are stupid to why they got into a lockout, where everybody, for some reason, seems to think you can get everything done in a CBA, where there's, there's a thing called amendments for a reason. 
which for some reason <laughs> neither of these sides believe exists anymore. So um, that that tell that us has, how you really feel, Pro Joe. That, that has a, a half decent factor into why they're locked out. That I mean, uh, we would never have had any CBAs in any sports leagues if they didn't think they could amend them later, because then they would say, "Well, we got to get this done now." So. Yeah. That it seems like they're trying to get everything fixed in one swoop, but we're talking about yeah. that more into the future as we have a lot of hockey stuff to talk about, like up in Montreal, wow. Lance GM search, Jim Benning, Travis Green being fired, our head coach Elaine Vigneault with uh, Michelle Terry being let go on the same day, and then of course just the players that have been going on and cruising and going hot and the teams like the avalanche, like the lightning and others that have been going good. So we'll get right into it. Um, before we go down the rabbit hole of discussing the flyers, cause that's both of, um, our team, something I believe, um, that the Canucks did right was they, of course, they got rid of Jim Banning and Travis green, but they had somebody, that they knew immediately as right in unison, it kind of was, oh, Bruce Boudreaux hired as their head coach. Now, I said this in the video I did about the Canucks. This is not going to be a flip of the switch. I don't think it's going to be like the St. Louis situation where all of a sudden now the Canucks turn into a Stanley right. Cup contender team and everything's great and yeah. daisies and gum drops and everything's moving in the <laughs> opposite yeah, direction. No. And, like, I feel like that's a rare situation. Where that's not going to happen, but bringing in Boudreaux should be able to bring in, like I said, a new mold, a new mentality, a new vibe, and it should spread and be kind of infectious through the team that you kind of have that energy that Bruce gives out. Because he was, like I said in my video, patted on Sports Tonight News, he's one of the most fun guys to watch on the bench, so it'll be fun to have him back when he's yelling or when he's just sitting there like, yeah. Like, he has some of the best coach expressions of anybody, whether it was with the Wild or any of his other team, that from that alone, it'll be fun to have him back in the league. But from the other side of things, I feel like Green's a coach kind of similar to Tockett, but in a different sense. He's under 500 more because of his situation he was in rather than his coaching abilities. Like I, Where for Green, it's because Jim Benning is a doofus and doesn't know how to make moves that are structurally effective for your team. Okay. Years moving forward. Where, like, okay. you have, you just were thinking of, because if you think of the five year run of Green, it seemed like it was the team always thinking, we're in contention, we're in contention. Where I listened to a, one of those Twitter spaces where Canucks fans were even talking about it. No, not many fans thought they were all of a sudden a cup contender after they had that great playoff run in the bubble because it was because Thatcher Demko decided he was Dominic Hoshik and saved every single shot thrown on the net so that shouldn't make you think oh we're now a cup so and then last season shouldn't have made them think that and yet they still go out bringing oel they of course traded for jt miller beforehand and then where garland makes a little bit of sense because he's a young guy you're bringing into still a retooling situation but jim benning treated the canucks like they were a cup contending team via the moves he made not i'm not sure if that was his mindset of thinking but the moves he made made it seem like he thought they were much ahead of where they're at, and I can't put that on a head coach for not getting the results out of a poorly constructed structural team. Like, like, like they're not, they got people that don't work well for the cap. They got too much offensive guys, or like Tucker Pullman, who's not a bad third okay. line defensive, but is playing out of place. You have too many guys that you let go and then brought in guys that are playing up a role that are more just suited for the roles that they actually have played their entire career, where they they're they're not in a good structural necessarily spot and they're definitely not in a good cap spot that's why i was saying it's not it's going to be yeah. tough for bruce Boudreau to come in there because you're going to keep seeing changes in vancouver because they have to bring in more assets because benning screwed them over with the draft too his drafting's been atrocious minus a couple people like they don't have much the biggest issue they need is defense they got rathbone i believe and then only a couple other guys that are a few years away they don't have a great defensive prospect core you have a you have a Colson and Hoglander already up. You don't have right. the next. You only have one other guy at the forward core that they're really really high on as like a guy that's a B plus or higher guy. So you need to be able to figure that out. Where I think Benning almost pulled the end of career Holmgren thing, and just kept going for the success ring, and they wasn't yeah. getting there. Where wasn't once your there. managing style gets stale, 
it got stale and similar to how I felt about Holmgren, who I've loved his tenure as a player, as everything else he's done. That's why he's in a Hall of Fame. He just didn't work out as the GM at the end. Is yeah. he, That might have been a little late that they made the decision. I'm sure a lot of Canucks fans, when I was reading the Facebook group, they were rejoicing and glad Benning was fired. Most were like, I really enjoy Green as a dude. It was just his time. It was the time to move on. Where at Benning, they're like, oh, thank God this guy's gone. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, different reaction there. <laughs> right. Because even Perlo said, too, it's like he thinks that Green will get a job somewhere else. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, at least as an assistant at the very least. Or something, right. Yeah, okay. That could even be here because they said we're more likely to hire an assistant than the one tweet that I saw, but who knows. Uh, yeah, um, but no, I think this is going to be a good thing for Vancouver. We already know what Boudreaux brings to the table. We've seen he's a high-energy guy. He has a up-tempo system. You know what I mean? He lets the stars do whatever the heck they want. I mean, he, he coached Ovechkin for how many years? You know, the only knock on him is going to be the fact that, you know, he hasn't really won it in, in, in the playoffs. But let's face it, all Vancouver needs to do right now is just win a couple games. Right, we're not talking about yeah. playoffs. They're, try, they're trying to get the they're trying to get the momentum going back, swinging in the right tide. Where right, he's a good guy to do that. Where they're not yeah. thinking of playoffs this year, and if they start retooling, they're not even going to really be thinking of playoffs next year. Next so year, you're just either, having right. a guy that tries to keep bringing the same energy and yeah. the right energy mm-hmm. and attitude every night as your coach. And Bruce Boudreaux does fit into that category. I'm with you on that for sure. Um, I think this is going to be all the way around because I feel this is going to be a good thing for Vancouver with getting rid of Bennington. Or, or, or I'm Benning. sorry, Benning. Benning. Yeah. I'm sorry, I I'm getting do that sometimes too. Yeah, right. Just because. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So getting rid of him, I think, is is a good thing. I also agree too that Green. It was probably his time. You know, coaches get to a well, spot. For a different reason. It was kind of his. It just got stale for yeah, him. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's Where what I was for getting Benning, at. It was he just made mistake after mistake, mistake. after. It was like a pile up of. Bad exactly. That led to exactly. It. And Green is only able to do with what. He's given it's, my bet. Oh, that's what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, he kind of got fired by, you know, by proxy, <laughs> I guess. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the guy ahead of him got fired. So it's like, well, you know. Uh, but uh, like I said, I think Green's going to find an assistant uh, position somewhere else. Uh, or a head coaching position. Or even, yeah. Hey, that yeah. could end up being open and or open. So Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's going to be the thing. I think there's going to be a couple more jobs opening up here, probably the end of this season. There's usually always an average of like six coaching changes per year is the average. It has been for the last like five or six seasons where there's been about an average of between five and six coaching jobs that become available throughout the entire year. Yeah. Right. That's why like the bed of the world that have been and green before now, five years, that's a pretty good run in today's game. That's what um, I mean. Bed North, six years, that's a good run, a very yep. good run. Yep. Um, so, like, that's impressive for those guys that were able to stick around. Tippett was in in uh, Edmonton for a couple years. That was like four or five minutes. He's definitely been there for a few years now. That would be more. Eight, I think. Well, he's been there for eight years? Okay, well, that, well, time flies. <laughs> Dave Tippett. You know, maybe, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm thinking maybe, <laughs> okay. I'm thinking maybe. I don't know. I have I have no idea. Either way, so. I think he's one of the longer tenured guys, so we got that down, but I didn't know yeah. Long. but um, I could be mistaken, so don't hold me to that. No, but. no, no, I'm not. But I'm just, I was just, I just knew he's been around for a little bit. Yeah. But I agree. I think this is a good move for the Canucks. They need new vibes in there. They need somebody that's going to come in. I, I think it's going to be right now. I'm pulling up the um thing I saved that I talked about in my video that Ian McIntyre put out. They're doing Chris Gear, Ryan Johnson, Henrik, and Daniel Sedin, obviously fan favorites, and then Dan Smile as all working together to basically be the management group as the interims all as a consolidated front. Um, that okay. is the unstructured style that you don't see as often a structure, not an unstructured style, but a structured style you don't see as often. So I envision somebody from that group, probably one, if not both of the Sedins, where you would then have a different structure there too, having two brothers running a team, ra- managing a team rather than just one individual. Uh, but that's something that has been rumored if not one of them, would both of them do it or one more? Wow. Ahead. 
So either way, though, whoever gets that job, it's going to take a three, I think, at littlest year stretch to get them really back to being a great contender because you want to keep the core, like the Hughes's, the Hoglanders you had developing, the Bacoles, and you, even exactly. if you want to back one of those guys around. You want to keep certain guys to build around around, but you got to get more assets again because Benning didn't draft well, and he drafted or traded away draft picks that he never drafted, so you got to bring in more assets yeah, to young yeah. that are going to grow in your system from other systems or draft assets that look like they'll be really good second-round picks, really good third-round picks if those teams are struggling, or especially first-round picks if you're able to find those uh, right. via some players that you have. So I think that's what their move has to be moving forward. But an interesting thing – uh, that will connect to the Flyers before we move into the Flyers, because that'll be our rabbit hole discussion, is the Canadians GM search that Jeff Gordon kind of complimented on or commented on and said they're not necessarily looking for a head coach at the current juncture since Ducharme obviously is a good French-Canadian guy that can speak. Uh, I think he's going to stay. We'll have to see going forward because Jeff Gordon is the executive vice president they made him of hockey operations where the GM comes in and sees differently. I wouldn't be surprised if to connect to the Flyers in a different direction, another French Canadian guy in Elaine Vigneault who just got let go from the Flyers is somebody that Montreal was interested in hockey news, put that out. They've said, even though they commented to Charm as a guy that they could keep around if they do decide to make a move by January, February, I feel like A.V. is kind of my bold prediction. I feel like he's the other guy they would go with because he's a master of the French, but also a master of the English language, and they want somebody like that yeah. for the general manager and mm -hmm. for the coach, which is why Gordon's also, he, he in his uh, press conference, it was hilarious. He spoke the first statement in French, all in broken French because he had it written down, and then said, you have to be patient with me. I'm still learning because they like having the both sides there. So he's still learning. Exactly. So it'll be interesting to see if they keep Duchamp, but for now they have him. I think that's the right decision for now. But my thing is if a new GM comes in and wants his own kind of guy, I feel like that will have a stamp on what they actually decide to do. So it's going to be depending upon who comes in. And one guy that's rumored to connect with yeah. the Flyers again is current Maine Mariners president in yeah. the ECHL, uh, mm -hmm. former Flyers forward, Canadians forward as well, uh, yep. Daniel Beer. So. Yep. That's an interesting name, a guy that seems like he's eventually going to get a job somewhere because he keeps being rumored in different uh, talks all the time. What, what do you think about one of our fun, most fun guys to watch when you saw him score the Daniel Breer celebration, doing a good job up Mr. there with Mr. Playoffs. Maine. He has um, Nick Master from my high school up there playing for him in Maine, and then Pascal LeBurge, a guy that didn't make yeah. it in our Daniel picked up and gave him a chance in Maine, so that was nice to see, and he's kicking butt. But what do you think of uh, Daniel Briere as being mentioned in all these jobs, and especially with the Canadians, because that um, would kind of fit for him from Canada, uh, playing yeah. with the Canadians, loving his I, short time. So. Here's another name I want to throw at you, too. How about Patrick Waugh? I've been reading about Patrick Waugh. <laughs> okay. Like he's a <laughs> okay, so so there you go. So uh, I'd love to see Danny Breer get something anywhere. I don't care. As long as he's doing something where he's happy and successful, that's all I care about. Um, is he going to be a good general manager? Well, he's he bought that team that he's running right now, the, the main Mariners or, or whatever. He's part owner. And I owner. also think he will be because he said there was an That's, interview that I've watched where he described how involved he is in not just the management yeah. side of things, but the yeah. everyday. Like, he meets with the coach. This was last year, the interview, so it was when it was Riley Armstrong, who's actually the Phantoms assistant coach now. But okay. um, this year, it's um, I'm blanking on his name, but they got the new coach up there where he meets with him, goes over the game plan, is always at practice every morning. Then he, after he's done with all that, he goes upstairs, does all the management stuff. So he always loves the hand-on approach from both ends, where from a former player perspective, obviously, rather than just some of these guys that are GMs as the business people, I think that has a different effect because you're yeah. always around. You're a guy that if you give advice to somebody, it sticks more because you actually went through it yourself. It's not a business guy saying, well, maybe if you did this differently – 
I'm not saying obviously business people are great as GMs. We've seen it time and time again. But when it's a player, it's from a different perspective and a different voice to have yeah. him down in the practice and talk to you and kind of even air you out at times as a general manager saying, if you guys just do X, Y, and Z, you would be in a better spot rather than doing X, Y, and Z that you're doing right now. It sticks exactly. more because he's the former player. Well, you see coaches obviously more being former players than you do general managers at times, other than exactly. like the sack. You see a lot yeah. of people, the business or the former coaches as general managers, not always the players. Okay, but let me let me throw something at I, you, right? I, yeah, I was just going to say, so do you not have a lot of respect for Stevie Y? Not just as a player, but as a general manager? Well, no, he's a good general manager. I'm just saying, I'm saying players, I think, sometimes have a different connection being general managers that's better than business people. Oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. former player... Yes. That you can connect different perspective player to player level from that connection to also a boss to employee level, because that's obviously what you are as a player to the general manager. You can kind of connect on both sides. If it's a well, former yeah. player like a stack, I'm saying sometimes I think that's a benefit. That's why I think with Montreal, because they have a good young grouping of some guys coming up. Briere has been dealing with young guys in the ECHL for the last couple of years. Now he already knows how to help nurture guys along and says he's even been involved with helping develop people during COVID. He helped the flyers with the development stuff. He was with yeah. Lappy each day, yep. different stuff. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he has that background. I feel like he would fit well there. Not to mention he already said he loved the city. He walked down uh, the street in Montreal because he said it was closer if he just walked and went down to his apartment to get the feeling of everything there when before you went into the stadium and then he would walk into the stadium and then go to the game, which that would always get him the most pumped up. He talked about how he loved every city in that interview, like Philly and everything. If people want to check it out, it's on flow hockey, but um, he talked about how much he would just loved his short time in Montreal and he's already ingratiated himself so much in Maine. It seems like he will do the same thing there. I feel like he's a good choice for Patrick. Waugh, I think would be a fun choice for us as, People cover like doing this podcast covering the game, being media. with stuff covering the game. We fun for the media because not the ones that are there asking them questions, but the people that aren't physically there asking them questions. It would be fun for them to hear him because he has no filter and he exactly. has no control over his own well being some of the time. Where uh, agreed, you, that's why. Like, basically, you just know you're going to get the truth from him, but sometimes it's going to be something you should not say. Um, after you won like a six game winning streak and then you lose two in a row, like it's something that like you'd be like, well, yeah. <laughs> be careful what you ask might, him. That might be the case, but you you still are t six and two in your last eight and one yeah. and lost by one in those games. I wouldn't be blaming the goaltender, say for one example, all too much. Like if he did something like that, but no, I'm with you. I'm with you. But I agree. I agree. And but. No, it was just a name that I had read as well that was part of that swirling derby of who's going to potentially be up there in Montreal. You know what I mean? Uh, I like Danny Briere as a possibility. I would not have a problem with that. I think that would be great. Um, not just for the Canadians, but I think it would be great for Danny Briere too. Um, I think he's, like you said, he's – done a really good job up there in Maine and he's really proven that he's pretty much that material where he's going to be able to slot right in and be that kind of guy. Now, can he build a team? You know, can he evaluate what, how good is he at evaluating talent? Can he build a team? That's what's going to, that's where it's going to be, man. That's going to be where the money meets the road right yeah. there for him. Well, he's done that a little bit also down there in Maine because as a president of an ECHL team, you do a yeah. lot in, recruiting and building and all that as well um but yeah you have to see at the next level is he able to translate that but i think it's he's getting to the point you've seen him rumored in searches it's time for him to maybe get a job in montreal seems like a good job that could be a good fit for him unless if also he decides to go to the other canadian team who hired a head coach but if they don't decide to go with the sundeans Will Danny Briere be an option for Vancouver, who never officially brought in, obviously, a new GM? They just have that management yeah. group for right now yeah. that I yeah. have mentioned. Um, okay. But the next thing we can move on to before the Flyers craze is, 
it seems like almost a foregone conclusion that Tuka Reyes is going to re-sign with the Bruins whenever he is physically 100% and able to re- and ready to re-sign with the Bruins. Because he, now today, after practicing beforehand, he's been either practicing beforehand or after in the facility most of these days with people to get himself back into game shape. Where now, because of Olmark being out with, they described it as a non-COVID illness, um, they're great. they have him as the emergency e-bug goaltender, so he was able to hang around and actually practice and get reps with the team today. So nice. it already seemed like before him just being around the facility before and after was signs for 100% um, that he was going to come back. And then obviously now that he was able to practice with the club, he was the emergency e-bug goaltender. Um, he already got the reps. Everybody talked about how much they liked having him back at practice. It almost just seems like a foregone conclusion at this point that he is obviously going to be back in net. And also Linus Olmark has been up and down this year where Swayman's a guy that has been good, but is obviously young. Like some Bruins fan I saw put on their Facebook group, it'll be sad to see Swayman be the odd man out just by default with the way contract structures are. Olmark will stay up most likely. But uh, he's a guy that can go back down just because he's so young. He'll just learn more and get even better and then be back up next year at that point, probably potentially as a starter or depending upon what Reyes decides to do past this season. So Yeah, 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 yeah I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, man, what do you think? Are you uh, are you ready to dive into this rabbit hole? Are we ready to – should we put on our Buster Crab swim fins and go for the plunge? Well, yeah, for um, people that obviously – honestly, I did not think it would happen now. Uh, Al Morgani kind of talked about it a little bit on the post game last night where yeah. this loss was such a damning loss that it could be a result that would lead to that happening. But just with the amount of games you had this week, it's similar to what I was saying about Zimmer with yeah. the Vikings. You didn't see it in the timing structure of the schedule – this would be the week. It would be more, oh, maybe after this week, not maybe, most likely after this week, if it kept going downhill, that's when you were going to do it. But the Flyers decide to, after the 7-1 to loss to the Tampa Bay Lightning, that seemed like the final icing on the cake, that they were going to get rid of Elaine Vigneault. And also a guy we talked about in last week's episode, excuse me, Michelle Terrian, who was the way that they probably could have saved Elaine Vigneault's job, just my own personal opinion. If they got rid of Michelle Terrian earlier and let Darrell Williams do the job that he's doing right now before this season started, but that's a different story for a different time um, since Darrell Williams is now running our power play and doing our offense, which would have made sense for him to do at the beginning of the season and just let go of Michelle Terrian to begin with. But we do that now. We have Mike Yo as the interim head coach. The first game is, of course, against the Colorado Avalanche and the Rookie of the Month in the AHL last month, Eustace Anunen, um, who was in net tonight for them. But it was a time, it was the easiest decision to make is obviously getting rid of the head coach. Michelle Terry is the guy that should have been gone last year, where AV is the guy that I didn't think would be gone last year because of the whole, he, he was a very practice-structured coach, like everyone's been saying. And last year you didn't have practices where – that's something that they, the Flyers fed, agreed with that and, and ran with that. But as an assistant, if your power play and all that's not working, I still thought Turian would have been gone after last year. And then you would have had AV, you would have had him come in with a new vibe, a guy with new vibes, a guy with a new voice that kind of said, well, maybe what you're doing here is why – X didn't work, Y didn't work, and Z didn't work last year compared to the first season when you were almost a Jack Adams winner. Like, maybe this is what you have to do to get back to being almost a Jack Adams winner, and you would have had a new voice in that role. That's why I think management first failed. And not just Fletcher, this team has a lot of management, the advisors of former players. They have a huge upper management core, as well as their GM, the Philadelphia Flyers where they just kind of went with everybody and kept everybody minus the fact that they, of course, brought in uh, Williams and made Lappy the um, coach of the uh, Phantoms down there. So that's the only change they really made. So it seemed like it was one of those non-reactive enough after last season to get a new assistant in here that would have took Terrian's job that led to this. And also the fact that 
AV wasn't getting the results this season started. I wrote it down. Uh, up until the November 16 when we beat the Flames 2-1, to one, we were 6-0 and after a loss. So at least if you lost, the Flyers had that resilience and bounce back. After that game, uh, obviously that wasn't the case. Is Then we started going on this eight-game losing skid that we have now. We started the 18th game that Drew went off, and we lost 4-3 to three to Tampa. So yeah. mm-hmm. um, it, it's, a, it's a season you started off scoring. The scoring went down. You were winning because of goaltending and winning because of decent shot blocking, getting in passing lanes, and winning ugly games like two to one against Washington, two to one against Carolina, two to one against Calgary. Those were all ugly wins, but you got it done. And then right. once that magic kind of fizzled away, you weren't able to find a way to pick it up, and it all just went back to last season's problems again. Once it went downhill, yeah. nobody was there to bring it back up. Which two mm-hmm. seasons ago. Whenever there was the sputtering a bit, the Flyers did bring it back up. And obviously before the COVID stoppage, they were one of the hottest teams when they weren't one of the hottest to start the season. And then that's kind of how it went reverse this year. They were one of the hotter offenses, like 4.5 goals per game to start the season. Fell yep. off, but were still finding ways to win. And then just completely fell off a cliff. And even more so, arguably, than last year, completely fell off a cliff because they had nothing going for them during this eight-game winning streak or losing streak. So right now, Philadelphia is at 1.48 goals per game. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know about you, but that's like right there near Arizona. Yeah, you can't win. I mean, that's the thing. You're not, you're not going to win even like AV was quoted saying, um, like, we have to find more ways to win two to one. I think that was like three or four games ago post game. He uh-huh. talked about, like, if you can't score, you got to find ways to win like that. Well, even – you're only going to win one nothing if you're scoring 1.4. I mean, you can't even win 2-1 to one if you're barely putting out a two-goal output. That's been the big issue with the Flyers. Um, but it's also, I think it's a thing that I was saying they should have brought in a new assistant because he could have kind of changed the structure a bit where we have been playing dump and chase for years. And it's been, even without AV, the Flyers have used dump and chase for the past oh, decade gosh. with different coaches, with different players. And they've used the system, but w- within the system, they ran a more effective system for the current players where they wouldn't just have one guy come in and have two guys retreat for a shift change all of a sudden, like we've been doing this year. And then you also have a team that's not as effective for the dump and chase system. Like you have to adjust over time with the Flyers. Giroux kind of said it perfectly once AV got fired and Fletcher said it in his thing. They're searching for their identity. They don't really have an identity right now we're normal we're, yeah. we're obviously even the dead back in the All day right. we she bully identity before in my lifetime we just had the you were always the tough grit and grind grind it out even when you were a bad team when you had ed it was always the we're not going to be embarrassed like we're going to find a way to try to compete each night like you had nitamaki the season i think it was the season after the lockout went out with a busted leg basically to try to go yeah it. You didn't have anybody else. So, like, you had the, you're going to grind it out and get through it. You don't have that same vibe uh, with that team team in in the current. Well, well, roster aside, you just don't have the same vibe going on around the team in general and the organization. Okay. So, I'm going to make a couple of observations. And this goes back to the end of the Bob Clark era. This team has never fully recovered from that, in my opinion. The Flyers, during the Bob Clark era, were pretty much bet the farm to get that one last guy that could get us over the hump. And then that one last guy would only be here until the end of the season, and then he was gone. Mm -hmm. I can rattle off a list of names as long as a hockey team of players that have been traded away from this team to go on to win Stanley Cups for other teams. Patrick Short. I said I could put together a list of names (laughs) of players from the Flyers over the last 20 years that we could make up another hockey team of ex-Flyers that have gone on to win a cup on another team. All right? Now – You've had a guy come in here and do nothing but care about the team and spend gobs of money to get that one player. 
Then you completely switched it up and did the exact opposite. I'm not saying that Philadelphia hasn't tried to win, but they brought in Claude Giroux. They never put anybody else around Claude Giroux. The only banner that's hanging from the Wells Fargo Center right now is Claude Giroux. Well, you look at all the other teams, heck, all you have to do is go across the state, and there's three banners hanging from the console energy center. You, you see what I'm you get see what I'm going with here, yeah. Joe? No, you right? have you haven't brought the pack but you, you brought people like for example Cooch who's having an under productive season this year you brought in Proveroff who's having an underproductive season uh th- this year as well but you haven't brought in G's the only guy that you're seeing it more this year because he's had to bring it out but earlier in his career would do what he did against Tampa get through the defense and basically have that screw this moment I'm jumping in and taking over this game because I'm done with everything else that's going on around here where you need to have other guys that kind of bring the tide with him and you have to have the guys coming through the pipeline where that's why the last couple of years to put it in comparison when people were saying a couple of years ago oh Kopitar slowing down Kopitar yada 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 I always disagree with that because the Kings had people to come to play around Anze Kopitar coming up their pipeline where same thing and, with Tampa and, Bay and it wasn't guys that because the Flyers don't get me wrong coming the fans and stuff we have guys that I think can play very well in the bottom six but I mean guys coming in the pipeline that are the next Jeruz, like the next guy that really takes the man. Oh, I mean that level of player. Like that's a different so, level. So, so now let me ask you, okay. So they bring in one defenseman who's a star player and they completely overuse him because they only bring in one, right? They bring in what they got G, then they have a star defenseman teaming in Desjardins, um, Niskin in pick one. Right, they get completely blown out, overused, overworked, put in every situation. Even if they're not good in every situation, they play everything, right? Yeah. So they haven't, bu- and then we have pretty much mediocre goaltending. Okay, and now up until now, yeah, that was throughout, yeah, the two. Yeah, that's what I mean, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. so now you're going to probably have to sell Giroux, Carter Hart, a couple of these other guys because. You went all in in this offseason, right, to bring in all these AV guys to build around Hayes, a fill-in guy who's making $7 million a year. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Hayes, like, we saw it when um, JJ kind of hinted at it um, last night before we knew that AV was hired. You, you want it, like Fletcher said in his comments in the end of November, you want to see the team at full force, but you did, just didn't have the time to wait where Hayes isn't there. He's not, you can tell with his play, he's not the 1920 Kevin Hayes yet because he's been going through the injuries. You probably rushed him back a little bit and then he got right. down again and then he came back. So Point uh, again. All, all those different factors went into it. But I think they built the team more so – you try to build it around Hayes having his buddies in there, but that's also because you try to bring in a new locker room structure of guys that already had the familiarity, exactly. with stuff, which you saw work it with different teams. Like the Blackhawks have done that, had guys that played on junior teams before with each other. The um, Avalanche have done that. Avalanche did it, that yeah. Mm-hmm. Play with, that played when younger with each other. Teams do that. It's just you then, the other side of it is putting those players in the right baseline strategy so it actually works for the players you have and that's not really AV failed at that. i think the flyers did a good job at and yeah av didn't do a good job at that but i don't think it's 100 percent also on av i think it's also on the fact that fletcher and the upper management was blinded by the lights of last season and the COVID effect yeah. where they went let's keep every assistant coach minus the guy we're promoting to the phantoms head coaching job to bring in darrell williams when I thought that was the wrong decision, I'm kind of with you, Reef. I never really thought Michelle Terrian was the right guy in the first place when he got hired because he never was good at running an offense or a power play. And you have him to do both of those things. It didn't make any sense. Um, where Williams is a guy with AV that's done multitudes of things when it was with the Canucks and when he was with the, um, uh, the Rangers because he's spent most of his time with him. So yeah. 
I think that's a guy that would have worked out better at the start of the season, but it was too little, too late. You now give him the job he could have had at the beginning. But we'll see how he does now with Mike Yo. And then Lappy was also back on the bench uh, for tonight's game since the Phantoms don't have a game until Friday and it's against the Hartford Wolfpack. For people that I don't know, we're still in COVID protocols themselves in the AHL, right. so they haven't played in a while. So that's still a if that game even happens. Okay. Phantoms are out of COVID protocol. Well, the Phantoms have never really been in protocols. What about America. Hershey? Only Cam York has been. Uh, Hershey is not officially out of it. None of the teams are officially, because Rochester okay. was the first team that yeah. was supposed to officially get out of it, other than Bridgeport that did return yesterday, but that All was right. announced along with the okay. Islanders. Rochester's okay. game was further delayed on the weekend, and then Lekin and then got called back up to Buffalo because Subban got injured in his first game. Yeah, first game, yeah. With Buffalo. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's how that ended up going down there. Okay, well, let me ask you a question then, okay? And and I, I want to end on this question. Who is the next star for the Philadelphia Flyers? Um, Like, I, and I mean, when I mean star, I mean Giroux level. At yeah. least Giroux level. I mean, I think the easier question to answer right now, because I feel like you have a potential scorer. Like, I heard Pirlo talk about... His speed, which I do agree, he's not the quickest skater, Tyson Forster, but if you can shoot like Phil Kessel, you don't have to be the quickest skater as long as somebody can just get you the damn puck so you can shoot the puck like like, like Phil right. Kessel. That, that's, okay. your own, that's your only issue there. You need to mix in more of the guys that can move like G did in his prime coming up, but I think Tyson Forster is a perfectly fine player to have. A guy that is a it, under the radar guy to watch just because he does have the skating speed and the hands to match it is the guy we just picked in the second round. I'm not sure if I'm going to say elite, but all star level player. I could see Tumala, who we got out. Uh, yeah, from overseas being a yeah. all star level player because there's a difference when I say an all star level player to elite. Elite's like where Giroux was at in a lot of his seasons, eighty something, ninety something, one hundred something points, really carrying the team's weight. Where all star levels like the 65, 75, like just being a great guy, like how Hayes was in 1920. Yeah. Like in the yeah, first yeah, yeah. season here, Kevin Hayes, that would be an all star level performance. Agreed. Yep. Like, I, no, no, little, no. I agree with what you're saying. It's a little bit different there. Yeah. But um, I feel like the easier question to ask would be who's going to be the next coach? Because I feel like with this, it might be more uh, who's the Flyers going to decide to pick between. Savoy, uh, Slavowski, Logan Kuwe, Nemec, Connor Geeky, uh, Joakim Kamel, Daniel Yorov, uh, Shane Wright, if you get into those sweepstakes. That might be the answer if we keep going down the tide we're going right now, where it will be who do we pick in the top 10 of the 2022 NHL draft? And then there's my answer for you. So that's why I'm saying that question is not real easy to answer right now because there's some later round guys. Connor McLennan, a former, a former six round pick, is killing it maybe he can be a steal jr avon is an undrafted guy he flies on his skates he's killing it maybe you they can be a did steal, answer it but you're not going to project those guys to elite coming as late rounds you're going to project them more to maybe they can be all stars and we'll see where they get from there you see joe if, i tricked you i tricked you man i asked you a trick question okay how i tricked you was this you answered it for me you answered it correctly the next Claude Giroux is not on the team. Or he's in juniors right now as someone in your that you just recently signed to an ELC. Yeah, like they're not they're not that close. They're not gonna be here. Tyson Forster, maybe. Well, no, I'm not talking about I'm saying like if we talked about just all-star level players, elite to all-star level is different. I don't think the the Flyers have right now a prospect that you would project to translate to the next elite guy. You have guys that might translate to being all star scorers really good. and all around overall players, like I think Tumala can translate to, and maybe great third liners that mm -hmm. McLennan, um, yeah. and um, what's his name, uh, J.R. Avon, and even Avon. also Bob Brink. If he can continue to, because he's a quicker skater as a shorter yeah, guy. Yeah, I'd also like to see O'Brien and see what O'Brien can do too. I just like to yeah, just like to see that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that was why it was a trick question because the player doesn't exist on this team yet. I, in my opinion, I don't think Most that player. Yeah. It's right. 
Okay. Have to see the time so it's going to have to be somebody they're either going to have to pick up in the draft or somebody they have to pick up in free agency or right. or a steal from the KHL or you know something. Going to have trade. to come from somewhere or trade or whatever, whatever. So, all right, but my man. A question though that we didn't uh, say that's something that probably is important since we mentioned uh, GMs for the Canadians. I don't think Mike Yo. It looked like Fletcher's kind of. It was confusing because in the release for tonight's game, like Martinez said, they said for tonight's game would be the interim head coach. But then Fletcher talked about how he's not rushing the coaching search and is going to search more for an assistant. So there's kind of been like mixed. Yeah. Vibes from what they're going to decide to do there. Yeah. But I feel like he probably won't be, in my personal opinion, the Gordon situation where they wait till the end. I feel like with Gordon is getting fired, especially if Trotz yeah. is fired, um, that will then open the door to saying, well, Barry Trotz is now. So we're going to um, wow. get rid of Mike Yo. And uh, because some Islanders fans are actually calling for that, even though they've been going through the, all the COVID issues in the world. And a bunch of different things out there. Yeah, that's the last thing I would do is fire that coach. I mean, I, I'm well, hey, what do I know? No, I mean, most people didn't think Bruce Boudreau would be. Let's remember, going back to when he got yeah. fired, Febu- I think it was February of, of 2020, like nobody thought he was he was coming off of a fairly solid season with the Yeah. Long- nobody thought he was going to be fired, and then it was just kind of one of those things that they wanted a change of the guard where that's sometimes why guys get fired too. It's not even always a hundred percent their fault. Based. Yeah. It's sometimes just we think we need a new voice to put us over the extra hump to get us to where we want to get to, basically. Gotcha, gotcha. But in terms of head coaches, would I don't know. He just got fired. Would Green be an option? Now Travis Green again is a guy I think you have to bring in a more offensively inclined assistant. If you have Travis Green, the same goes with Rick Tockett. If you hire Rick Tockett. Right. I don't necessarily think he would be the wrong head coach because he would fit with the media and he would fit with the city. He would be the wrong head coach if you did what you did with this head coach yeah. and you don't focus on the right assistants around him. I don't think the Flyers did a good job at hiring around AV either, where if you bring in Rick Tockett and do a poor job, like the only guy I really loved that we hired around AV because we hung on to Lappy, so that one doesn't count, um, yeah. would be Yo was actually a productive defensive coach. You put him in a role just to do defensive stuff when he's no more as a defensive guy. That's exactly. the only one that made sense. Yeah. Where otherwise, okay. I feel like if you bring in Tockett, if you hire well around him, he might do fine. Because if you bring in, say, say you get uh, Chris Noblaw, the guy that did really good with the power play and offense and Haxel Zero, and you're See, able to See, that's who I like. Wolfpack. Yeah, like you would have to try to get him out of the uh, contract he has with Hartford because he's their head coach for the Hartford Wolfpack. I but, know. But if you could do that, he would mesh well, I think, with Tockett, because Tockett, as the head coach, can just really focus on the defensive end of things, and then Noblock can really just focus on the power play and offense, and then I feel like those two guys would kind of fit well together, that that's kind of what I'm talking about. I don't think Rick Tockett's the wrong head coach. I think he's the wrong head coach with certain people as the assistants. Like, if you just move Yo back to an assistant, yeah. that won't work, because you have two more defensive, from experience, defensive guys of running the system there, you're not going to have enough push unless if Darrell Williams is really pushing the offense, you're not going to have enough push. And we haven't seen enough experience of Williams being like a big right. second-hand head coach until really now or with AV. He did stuff with the Rangers and Canucks that he did a good job on, but now he's really getting a chance to run the power play and kind of be one of the second uh, we'll hot there. Yeah. We'll see, right? We'll see. So I got a question for you, Joe. Do you got any uh, upcoming articles uh, coming up here or any upcoming shows coming out here soon? Yeah, I always put out different hockey stuff, different baseball, football, whatever, mostly hockey and baseball on my Sports Fanatic News. And then over at Flyers Nitty Gritty, I put out different articles in the Flyers, Phantoms, and Reading Royals um, as well. So, yeah, we do all that stuff there. And then once we get – the Steel Flyers site set up for more blogging and different posts and stuff would put a little bit more put them on there too, stuff yeah. out there. Yeah, to be to do that and have some fun there as well. But before we go, the last thing I just had to shout out some players since one is up. Uh, Eustace and Newton was the goaltender of the month in the AHL. Uh, Martin Frick uh, was the um, who obviously has been up before uh, in the NHL was the player of the month in the AHL. And then if we want to go with the player of the week, that was a uh, heat. Connor Mackey was named the AHL player nice. the first week of December. And then when it comes to the rookie of the month, 
that was Matthias McKelly who got picked in the Ooh. fourth fourth round. Yeah. The fourth round by fourth the uh, round. Arizona Coyotes, who is somebody that people were saying, like Jamie, maybe the Flyers should have interested him. Quicker skater, good offensive instinct. Didn't yeah. go after him, having success down there uh, yep. with the Tucks and Roadrunners. And then when it comes to just a last point on overall coaching situation, some guy we forgot about to mention is also Claude Julian, who still hasn't been hired since, of course, moving on from the Canadians. Is he a guy, one, that still has as much interest in coming back to coaching, being where he's at in life at this point, and two – on how interested would teams be in Claude Julien at this point. But obviously he has a great track record, so that's somebody that was also, I just realized, yeah. was not thrown out there. No, and I haven't seen his name associated with anything related to the Flyers or anything either, you know what I mean? And so uh, you know, I thought they would be more inclined to be with Vancouver than they would be with the Flyers. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So, so the names that are out there right now, I thought were more inclined with Vancouver than they were with the Flyers. But now that Vancouver is taking care, well, taking Boudreaux off the work in Montreal because he yeah can, yeah is able to speak. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So English, so yeah. Cool, cool. All right, well there you go. If folks. they want oh. him to go back there, because obviously Claude Julian, part of the reason why he fizzled out in Montreal was really his health. His health, it yeah, was, it was, yeah, it wasn't. He had a health scare so, there, and he missed the playoff. Uh, he missed that playoff thing there when they were in the bubble. To me, yeah, why he fizzled out in Montreal was the health. Yeah. Where if he's yeah. healthy mm -hmm. now, he could probably come back. But mm -hmm. Matt Murray, um, also just a shout out. He was the player of the month of the ECHL. Uh, Cutler, and obviously not Jay Cutler, a uh, Utah Grizzlies forward. Brandon Cutler was the rookie of the month, and then Harvey was the goaltender of the month. Uh, Samuel Harvey for the Fort Wayne Comets in the ECHL. So that's just to review nice. who the players of the month were in both leagues. That in future podcasts, when we have more time and don't dive into as much NHL stuff, we'll dive into the minors a little bit more for you, you guys. We'd love to, man. We'd love to. Do. Yeah, which I also do over on my channel, where I'll be making videos about each of these guys as the player of the Sweet. month. And Connor Mackey, who seems like a steal of a undrafted yeah. pickup. Yeah, because it's never, it's never too early to be looking at prospects, man. You know what I mean? It's never too early to be looking at the guys that are going to be the next up-and-coming stars, the next up-and-coming up draft picks. You know what I mean? So I'm all down with looking at the young kids. I'm all down with checking these guys out. So, Joe, where can we get you? Where can we find you? And where can we follow you? Yeah, well, you can get me at um, Sports Fanatic News is the YouTube page with a PH. Uh, for the Philly Fanatic, and then also JJ Borick 26 is my Twitter. That's the best place to get me uh, on there. So those are the two places you can find me, as well as at Steel Flyers and Flyers Nitty Gritty as well, putting out content on those places as well. And as always, thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to both of our subscribers. Continue showing us the love and support because we really appreciate you and love you all for it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for checking us out. Just remember, folks, you can go to manscaped.com, type in the promo code STEELFLYERS, and get 20% off your entire order. Um, check out the performance package where it has a lawnmower. And trust me, you want this because you want to look good in the boardroom and you want to look good in the bedroom. Take care of your balls because then, then they will take care of you. <laughs> check it out. Uh, Manscaped.com. Steel Flyers is a promo code. Get 20% off your order. Check me out on Twitter at SteelFlyers52. You can check us out on the web at www.steelflyers.com. Thank you all very much for watching the J. B and Steel Show. We will check you out the next time. Thank you.